Hello, and welcome to History 131, American History Since 1877. My name is Scott Bluzowitz, and I will be the instructor for this course for the duration of the spring 2021 semester. Before we get started into today's lecture, I wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping things with regards to the syllabus. First of all, you should have all received a copy of the syllabus in an email that I sent a couple of days ago to the class. Uh, the syllabus is also currently posted on Blackboard as well. So you should all have access to the syllabus, should all have either printed a copy of it or stored a copy of it on your computer or flash drive, but the syllabus should be readily available. Now, with that said, I want to make a couple of changes to the syllabus with regards to assignments that you will undertake as the semester unfolds. The first of which is concerning your very first assignment, the primary source analysis assignment number one on the syllabus. It says that that assignment is due on Thursday, February 11th. I'm changing that. That will now be due of Wednesday the following week, that's Wednesday, February 17th. And consequently, your first exam, which is slated for Thursday, February 25th, that will be pushed back a day to Friday, February 26th. And as we go forward, all of these assignments are written assignments that require you to answer questions and form a clear and coherent argument to the questions posed. These, these will not be assignments that require a lot of memorization of dates and names and events, but rather with this course we're going to look at the significance of these events and these historical actors, historical figures, and what that meant for the, their time and what that meant going forward in American history. So this will be a little bit different than uh, the high school classes uh, that you might have taken in U.S. history. But one of my goals as your instructor for this semester is to get you to become better writers. Uh, I know there are a lot of students in this class that are not history majors or history minors, and that's perfectly fine. We welcome all of you to this course, uh, but uh, I think that writing is a skill set that will prove to be invaluable for all of you, regardless of what your course of study is. As you go forward with your undergraduate education at this university or pursue graduate student studies and enter the workforce eventually, writing clearly and being able to uh, respond with, with a good argument with, that's well-reasoned and well-thought-out is a, a skill set that you can take going forward, and it should benefit you both academically and eventually professionally, regardless of the field that you go into. So this will be a writing-intensive course. Uh, I will try to give you at least a week's lead time before the due dates for these assignments. So in other words, with primary source analysis assignment number one, you will actually receive the, uh, the assignment and the questions seven days in advance, if not earlier. That will give you plenty of time to construct your answers um, and upload to SafeAssign uh, your, your final uh, responses. I also urge you to use the resources available to you as far as writing goes. Um, there's a writing center at the University of Mississippi. They have professionals there that can read your drafts, give you tips and pointers, help you improve your writing. I stress to all of you, if you think you need to improve, or even after the first assignment, if perhaps you're unhappy with uh, the grade that you receive and, and want to know how to improve going forward, 
uh, please take advantage of the Writing Center and the um, resources available to you as far as writing goes and with regards to the assignments. So with that said, I will move on to the lecture for today, which is going to be about reconstruction. And we will look at reconstruction and specifically for today's lecture, we will concentrate on the first two questions that you see in this slide here. How will the South return to the Union after the Civil War? And what are the significant changes in the newly reconstituted Union and in the South for African Americans? We will discuss the Reconstruction in greater detail and examine the results of Reconstruction in the next lecture, which will be posted on Monday. But for now, let's begin with the Civil War. The Civil War, as uh, you may remember, was fought from 1861 through 1865. And in the waning months of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, the President of the United States, was trying to wrestle with the question of how exactly do you put the country back together. The, it was very clear during these last few months of the war that the North was going to win the war and the South uh, had dwindling resources, dwindling manpower, and it was just only a matter of time before the South was going to eventually surrender to the North. And Lincoln had to figure out, how do you bring back the South? We're talking about an entire region of people um, who had seceded or had gone along with their local politicians and in, in, in local governments in seceding from the Union who had fought bitterly against uh, the Union uh, to establish their own nation state, the Confederate States of America. Now that that's all over, how do you bring these people back? It's a very divisive time in American history. And Lincoln began to devise a plan to bring back the southern states and their citizens to the Union. And that's where we will begin by discussing Lincoln's plan for Reconstruction. Lincoln's plan was known as a 10% plan, and it's called that because he was willing to allow the Confederate states to return to the Union when 10% of their voting populations, meaning 10% of the citizens in those states that had voted in the 1860 presidential election, with the last presidential election before secession and the war broke out, when 10% of the total voters voted and to take an oath to return to the Union and take an oath to the Union, Lincoln would let that state back into the Union and those Southerners into the Union. He would also offer pardons to Southerners who took the oath. And upon readmission to the Union, the Southern states must recognize the Emancipation of Slaves. Lincoln, of course, had issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. And the Southern states, if they were to rejoin the Union, would have to acknowledge the Emancipation Proclamation and uh, accept it and uh, realize that slavery was over. Along with that, the 13th Amendment was passed uh, in Congress during the uh, early days of 1865, passed on January 31st, 1865. This law legally abolishes slavery. And so the Southern states that wanted to return to the Union had to have a 10% of their voting populations take the oath to the Union and officially recognize the emancipation of slaves and the 13th amendment which legally abolished slavery in the United States going forward. And overall, this was a, a rather lenient uh, 
pathway uh, that Lincoln provided for Southerners and Southern state governments to return to the Union. It was designed to provide a smooth and forgiving path to the Union for Southern states. Lincoln was not trying to really hold these state governments and these prominent Southern individuals over a barrel and, and humiliate them. He just wanted to bring the Union back together as seamlessly as he possibly could, given the divisive nature of the war and the events that led up to the war uh, in the early 1860s. Unfortunately for the South, uh, and, and really unfortunately more so for the Union, uh, Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1865, just about a week or so after Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, signaling the end of the Civil War and the victory of the Union Army. And Lincoln was assassinated uh, within a week of that surrender. And that meant that Andrew Johnson, uh, a Tennessean, was uh, the vice president under Abraham Lincoln. And so he was able to ascend to the presidency to take over for Lincoln uh, once Lincoln died. And Johnson had his own plan for uh, reconstruction and for bringing the South back to the Union. And it was different than the plan uh, that Lincoln wanted to apply. And it, the, it did require Southern states to ratify the 13th Amendment. And that was kind of going along with what Lincoln had proposed in his plan, that, that recognizing uh, that slavery was illegal and that, that slavery um, could not continue to take place in the South. But Johnson, outside of that, was really interested in exacting revenge against wealthy Southerners, wealth, the wealthy aristocracy of the South. And these are individuals who owned $20,000 or more in property. Uh, Johnson's plan would provide pardons to all Southerners who owned less than $20,000 or more in property and assets. But for those that, that did own that amount, the, the wealthiest of the wealthy, the one percenters of their day, if you will, those folks would have to apply for individual pardons to Andrew Johnson. And by doing so, they would be uh, dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. Johnson's ultimate goal was to root out the wealthiest and most powerful and most influential Southerners from leadership positions in Southern governments going forward. He wanted to essentially <clears throat> prevent them from holding the type of power that they, that they utilized to drive states to secede and take arms against the Union uh, when the war began four years earlier. Outside of that, he was willing to allow Southern states to govern as they saw fit uh, going forward once uh, the, they ratified the 13th Amendment and the regular Southerners um, within those states were pardoned. And that meant that Southern state governments could govern as they, they saw fit. And those Southern states took advantage of the lenient plan of Andrew Johnson enacting legislation that significantly limited the freedom of African Americans. These laws and regulations were known as the Black Codes. And... They spelled out uh, several things that really uh, hindered the advancement of African-Americans socially, politically, and economically. 
Uh, first and foremost, the Black Codes prevented black men from joining state militias or serving on juries. So um, black men were, were unable to represent the state um, in, from a military standpoint or um, in the process of jurisprudence by jury service. In addition to that, the, many of the Black Codes, and the Black Codes were a state-by-state state thing, so there were perhaps different Black Codes in Mississippi than you might find in Tennessee, than you might find in Georgia. So it was sort of like individual state laws that were all established in the, the latter part of 1865 and early 1866. But one of the common um, restrictions uh, that, that the Black Codes entailed included vagrancy laws. Strict vagrancy laws were established, and these laws forced black men into menial labor if they could not pay fines. And basically, what that meant was that the in, in the states and in the individual counties and, and municipal areas where black men lived in the South, if they had a vagrancy law on the books, that meant that local law enforcement could stop black men on the street and ask them to provide proof that they were employed, provide some sort of paperwork to show them that they, that the authorities, that these men were indeed employed and had a job. If they could not provide proof or could not provide any sort of uh, evidence that they were employed, then these black men could be arrested by the local authorities and charged with violation of the vagrancy laws of the area. And in many cases, that meant that if they were convicted of the, the vagrancy laws, that these African-American men would either have to pay a fine or provide contract labor. And in many cases, the fines were in the neighborhood of $100, uh, which doesn't sound like a tremendous amount of money by our present standards, but back in the late 19th century, that was a, a significant sum of, of money and an amount of money that many black men did not have at their disposal to pay. And in lieu of paying the fine, they could be sentenced to, say, a year of labor to an individual company to work off that $100 fine. And this was sort of hard labor, legally enforced. And so the, the end result of these laws kept black men from uh, really becoming upwardly mobile and really advancing um, in terms of their economic status, their social status, and their political status. Political status. One prominent scholar, Doug Blackman, has labeled the, this system with the vagrancy laws as part of the Black Codes as slavery by another name. Doug Blackman wrote a very successful book uh, that was published in 2008. It was a national bestseller and a Pulitzer Prize winner in which he really examined the long-term impact of the vagrancy laws. The book was called Slavery by Another Name, Blackman making the argument that this sort of vagrancy law system was just another form of slavery and, and sort of a way for these southern governments to continue to have menial labor performed by black men uh, without um, without adhering to um, the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. So it was sort of a way to circumnavigate that. Um, and the ultimate goal of these black codes, all of them taken together, was that the southern state legislatures that created the black codes under Johnson's uh, plan was that they were trying to restore the political and economic order of the antebellum era 
in the years after the Civil War. So in other words, they wanted to the South to once again be part of America, which they had not been during the Civil War, but to be part of an America that in the South looked a lot like uh, the 1820s, the 1830s, the 1840s, the 1850s, when slavery was well established throughout the South and a primary uh, economic system by which Southern states, including Mississippi, prospered. That was the end goal, was restoration more so than reunion, if you will, by um, keeping African Americans and particularly African American men um, into a, a lower social and economic order. Now we move on from the Black Codes to yet another plan for Reconstruction, and this is the Radical Republicans Plan. And this was the response to Andrew Johnson's plan from the Congressional Republicans. Uh, these Republicans did not agree with Johnson's plan, which they felt was far too lenient on the southern states in, in terms of bringing them back to the Union and allowing these southern state governments and municipal governments to more or less um, come up with their own laws independent of the U.S. And, and with many of these laws being, as I said, designed to maintain some semblance of a slave type or a hard labor, forced labor type, type of system. So how do these Congressional Republicans respond, respond by passing the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and then um, also creating the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Taken together, these two things, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and the 14th Amendment, granted citizenship to African Americans. So that was the goal, was to provide citizenship to African Americans to ensure that they would have opportunities to advance and move forward. President Johnson disagreed with the Civil Rights Act of 1966 and ultimately vetoed that act. However, Congress, led by these radical Republicans, overrode the veto. And the end result was that the South was split into five military districts as opposed to individual state governments, and those military districts were patrolled by federal troops to enforce uh, sort of a, a federal law, federal policy. And in addition to this presence of federal troops, the radical Republicans' plan for Reconstruction included the requirement for all southern states to come up with, compose, write new state constitutions, officially ratify the 14th Amendment, and abolish the Black Codes in order to rejoin the Union. That was what the Radical Republicans wanted. And the final Reconstruction Act um, that sort of ends this, that sort of culminates, I should say, the legal portion of Reconstruction uh, in the early days of Reconstruction, the first five years, is the 15th Amendment, uh, which was ratified in 1870, and it gives voting rights to African Americans. Now, it should be noted here that many of the radical Republicans had cynical political reasons for coming up with these Reconstruction Acts and with trying to keep, uh, to override President Johnson's veto. And that is that they wanted to give uh, African American men the right to vote so that they could win elections and pick up seats in Congress, pick up the White House. Um, there, there was very clear 
political reasons. They were not just doing this out of the kindness of their heart to to uplift um, African Americans in the South and, and to uplift African American men, most of them anyway. Uh, there were exceptions. Uh, the leader of the radical Republicans was uh, Thaddeus Stevenson, or Thaddeus Stevens, I should say. He is pictured in the slide at, in the upper right-hand corner. Thaddeus Stevens had progressive views on, on race, and, and he was for equality. But many of the, his colleagues that helped him pass these laws uh, were doing it for political reasons first and social justice or equality reasons second. So the big question we have to really examine here is what changes for African Americans? How do these Reconstruction Acts uh, change for uh, change everyday life for African Americans in the South going forward? And the first and foremost, African Americans get citizenship. They're no longer slaves, they are citizens, but we have to take a, a long look at what does that mean for, their, for themselves and their families. First and foremost, beyond voting rights for African American men, black families are now able to worship freely, and we see a tremendous amount of black churches being built and constructed, established across the South. These churches become vital components of black communities in the South where African-American Southerners come together to worship, to, for fellowship, and to sort of provide stability to their communities in this sort of transitional period of American history. Other communal, community organizations uh, inclu that African Americans uh, would participate in are also formed during this time. This includes clubs, lodges, and mutual aid societies, several others in addition to those, but basically the establishment of community for African Americans that, that really wasn't there uh, during the antebellum period because they weren't free uh, to congregate outside of, of, of work and, and could, certainly couldn't form their own uh, churches or, or community centers. Another aspect of this is the African-American families start to uh, become whole again. The slavery system had split up many African-American families um, during the antebellum period as slave owners could sell individual slaves whenever they wanted to whomever they wanted. And so children were separated from parents, wives were separated from husbands, siblings were separated, uh, all in the name of business and commerce for the slave owners. Now, in this period after the Civil War, during the Reconstruction era, many of these families are becoming whole again. Relatives are finding each other, or at least looking for each other, to reunite. Marriages are becoming uh, legal and cemented, and we're, we're seeing uh, the black family really begin to uh, become stable uh, during the years of Reconstruction in the South. In addition to churches and other communal organizations, education is one of the major components of so the new social order in Reconstruction during, in the South, I should say, during Reconstruction. During the antebellum period, slave owners denied educational opportunities to their slaves. The big fear that they had was that an educated workforce would eventually revolt against slavery. So they did not allow their slaves to go to school or learn to read or do any of those things 
that would uh, provide them uh, with a formal education. In Reconstruction, new schools were built across the South for the specific purpose of educating former slaves and their children, their offspring. And these schools were segregated, uh, but they were uh, opportunities for black families across the South to earn formal education. And this would uh, result in generations of African Americans uh, attending classes as you had adults who were attending school along with their children because they were seeking the educational opportunity that had been denied to them uh, during the antebellum period uh, and during the war years. And one of the major beneficiaries, you can sort of see how this changes the, uh, the landscape of African-American life and African-American achievement after the Civil War is Mary McLeod Bethune. She's the woman pictured in the lower right-hand corner here. She is the daughter of, or she was the daughter, I should say, of former slaves born in South Carolina in 1875. She earned her education in a segregated school in South Carolina, but she did receive a formal education as a youngster in South Carolina and eventually wound up attending uh, a four-year college, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, and earned a bachelor's degree there. And after graduating from college, Bethune becomes an educator herself first as a teacher, and then eventually um, she opens her own school. She f is the founder of a four-year public college in Daytona, Florida, now known as Bethune-Cookman College, um, and it is one of the more prominent HBCUs, uh, that's historically black colleges and universities, in the state of Florida today, Mary McLeod Bethune establishes that school in the early decades of the 20th century uh, and beyond education she was also an activist who served as an advisor to President Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. She was, she was the first black woman to serve the White House in an advisory uh, capacity in American history. She is the direct product of uh, the policies that resulted from Reconstruction as she was able to advance further than her parents and her ancestors and sort of serves as an example of what was possible for African Americans in the South after the Civil War. Now, obviously, she's an exceptional example, but again, if she had been born 15, 20 years earlier, those opportunities would not have been available for her. Um, she took advantage of the changing landscape of the South in terms of social community and obviously um, legal uh, practices to, to get an education and, and, and become upwardly mobile. Uh, going forward in her life. But the biggest change, one might argue, uh, with the for African Americans after the Civil War and, and after um, Johnson's Reconstruction Plan was thwarted by the radical Republicans, was the 15th Amendment, uh, which provided African-American men with the right to vote, voting rights, a.k.a. the franchise, and it enabled black men to participate in the political process at all levels of government, locally, regionally, statewide, federal uh, government as well. What does that mean? It means that numerous black men run for and get elected to public office at these levels. 14 black men would serve as representatives in the U.S. House during Reconstruction, 
and two black men, Hiram Revels, who is pictured in the upper right-hand corner, and Blanche K. Bruce, served in the U.S. Senate. Uh, both Revels and Bruce represented the state of Mississippi in the Senate. And beyond holding public office, the, the voting rights and the franchise enabled uh, black men to uh, serve locally as delegates to state political conventions and to overall really um, impact the political process through their participation at all levels. And one of the more significant ways in which African American men used their newfound rights came in the presidential election of 1868. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, the Civil War hero, general from the Union, won the 1868 presidential election. Now, he won the Electoral College uh, by a wide margin, but he only won the popular vote by 307,000 votes cast out of a total of nearly 6 million votes. But Grant received more than 500,000 votes from African American men in that election. So African American men and their support for Grant put him over the top in terms of uh, winning the popular vote for the 1868 presidential election. Uh, that was an opportunity that was available uh, to these men in 1868 that was not available in 1864 or 1860 or previous elections. But the 15th Amendment provided voting rights to African American men. They, that allows them to participate in the political process. And we see black men holding public office, voting for local and federal candidates in free and fair elections, and also um, working as delegates uh, at state political conventions and other uh, political events that, um, and conferences, if you will, that directly impacted um, politics and legislation uh, during this period. Black women and women of, of all races were denied the franchise at this time. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more uh, next week, but women uh, would not get the right to vote until uh, the 19th century, well into the night, or excuse me, the 20th century, well into the 20th century, I should say. But African American men got the right to vote in the late 1860s and used it effectively. And so, with that, I will conclude our lecture for today, our first lecture, and we will pick up on Monday with a further examination of. Ulysses Grant's presidency and the final years of Reconstruction in the 1870s and take a look at the broader results of Reconstruction and how that impacted the decades that followed at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. There was some wide-ranging effects that, that take place that we'll discuss on Monday and also on Wednesday. And with that, I will close and tell you to enjoy the rest of your weekend, and I will talk to you again on Monday.